In the previous video, I started talking about a very small, tiny collection of essays consisting of three essays by Hermann Hesse. In that video, I talked about the first of those three essays, which is titled On Language. In this video, I'm talking about the second essay, which is titled On Reading Books. Now, how Hesse talks about the, the topic of reading, how he organizes this essay, is by introducing three categories of reading, three styles of reading. He can say, let's imagine that we can divide readings, styles of reading, or types of readings, or types of readers. Let's say, uh, for the sake of argument, that we can divide types of readers into these three categories. So the entire essay is organized based on the, that distinction between three types. Let's uh, start reading from the essay. He writes, when I set up the following three types, or better, stages of book reading, I do so not because the reading world divides itself into these three orders so that everyone belong to one genus or another, but rather each of us belongs sometimes to this, sometime to that group." End quote. And in fact, his argument is that these are three skills, three types of skills that we should all experience. We should all expose ourselves to these types of reading books. So what are these? types of reading. The first type of reader is what he calls the naive reader. The naive reader is somebody who gives total trust to the text, to the, to the author, and treats the author as a guide, as a, as a tour guide. Take me into your world, tell me what you believe in, tell me your story, and during the time that the naive reader is reading a book, he or she is totally suspending their disbelief, their willing suspension of disbelief, which allows us to forget. When we are reading naively, we are forgetting, almost forgetting the fact that what we are reading about is the creation of a subject, that what we are having access to is mediated by the work of a creator, by the work of an artist. So we forget and we neglect the middleman, the middle person, the author, and we have we treat the text, the content of the text, as objective, as give something that is given to us as part of an objective reality. So he writes, the subject matter gets taken objectively, gets acknowledged as reality. We get immersed into the world of the author. But from this naive reading, presumably a second type of reading, a, sec a second style of relating to the text emerges. He writes, as soon as a man follows his nature and not his education, he becomes a child and starts to play with things. Some bread becomes a mountain in which he bores a tunnel, and a bed becomes hell or a garden or a snowy field. So the play of imagination starts to have a dominant role in the second type of readership. Let's imagine a seesaw. The first type of reader is somebody who gives complete authority to the author and the text. So the seesaw is positioned in such a way that the reader gives authority to the text. The reader himself or herself has no authority, no control, gives and submits control to the author. In the second type of reader, uh, readership, the seesaw repositions itself so the reader and the text or the reader and the author have kind of equal position in relation to each other. Not everything is taken at face value. The reader starts to consider alternative ways of reading the text to question the authority of the author, say, maybe I can interpret the story in my own way. What Hesse argues is that the second style of being a reader arises out of our childishness and our playfulness. We read, quote, something of this childishness and this playful genius suggests the second type of reader. This reader esteems neither the content nor form of a book as his single and most important value. So what is the most important value? This reader knows, like children know it, that everything can have 10 meanings in a hundred senses. So the book almost becomes a tool for our flights of imagination, flights of interpretation. We start to become a little bit more uh, free from the dominant established interpretation of the text. Hesse writes that this second type of reader follows the poet not like a horse, the coachman, not the total suspension of disbelief, but rather like a hunter, his trail. Okay, so the first and the second type of readers are distinguished based on 
the free play of imagination that the reader brings into the text. Now that gets taken to its extreme, giving rise to the third type of reader, the, the third style of engaging with the text, which requires or involves maximum freedom from the reader. It gives maximum freedom, maximum free play of imagination. The authority of the text is, it diminishes to almost nothing. Let's read, quote, this third reader is so very personal, so much himself that he confronts his reading totally freely. He wants neither to train himself nor entertain himself. He uses a book like every other object in the world. It is to him a mere starting point and stimulus. It is fundamentally all the same to him what he reads. He could read anything. He could read a pamphlet, a menu at the restaurant. What matters is the effect, the consequence of the text in the experience of the reader, not where that consequence comes from, when the, where the effect comes from. The text itself becomes arbitrary and unimportant. He writes that this third type of reader plays with all, and from a certain standpoint, nothing is more horrible and fertile than to play with all, even though it is fertile, but it is also horrible, destructive. In the hour which our fantasy and faculty of association is at full height, we read no more of what lies before us on the paper, but rather swim in a storm of stimuli and ideas that come to us from the reading. They come out of the text. They can even emerge out of the mere letters. It can develop the happiest, the most approving thoughts out of a totally unimportant word that you turn around with whose letters you play like a mosaic game. In this state, you can read the fairy tale of Little Red Riding Hood as a cosmology or as a philosopher or as a blooming erotic poem. He then emphasizes that this th third type of reader that we are talking about is a limiting case. It is an ideal. It is something that we sometimes move toward, but it shouldn't be our only position as readers. Quote, the reader of the third stage is a reader no more. The person who belongs to it for a while soon will read no more. As the pattern of a carpet or the placement of stones in a wall would be worth as much to him as the finest page full of the best ordered letters. The only book for him would be a page with the letters of the alphabet. So this is a kind of reductionism, a reduction of everything into the most basic, most fundamental, most elementary, elementary components of reading. The third stage on which you are the most yourself will raise your readership, but at the same time, what else does it do? It dissolves all the disciplines and their authority dissolves poetry, dissolves art, dissolves world history. And yet, without knowing an inkling of this stage, you will ever only read every book, every science, every art, like a schoolboy reads a grammar. So the idea, I think, is that it is good to have access to the position of an anarchist, the position of someone who is willing to remove all boundaries that are set by authority and establishment and convention and tradition. It's possible to, to treat everything as raw material, as not sentences, not even words, but letters, and see what kind of thought, what kind of experience, what kind of flight of imagination the text in front of us, the stimuli in front of us can lead to. Okay, this is good enough for this second essay. Let me know what you think, if you have any comments, questions. And I might, to complete this little series, I might also make a video about the final essay in this collection, which is on poems. Thank you for watching.